and let us all that we can to build a better future. You know, Jimmy Dore, he's a comedian from Chicago. He has an extremely popular and successful YouTube show. He goes on comedy tours all across the country. When he comes here to Chicago, it's been like a hard lens media tradition. We always interview him, and it's always been insightful. We always enjoy his commentary. But there are many on the left that view him as a troublemaker or somebody who uh, is, is just wrong for the progressive movement, to which I have to say, what are you talking about? And they always say, well, he shows up on conservative shows, especially on Fox News with Tucker Carlson. To which I have to say, OK, and what's your point? He's reaching out to a larger audience. He's trying to speak out to people. He's yeah, at least he's trying to enlighten people about the problems that we're facing as a country, the issues that are severely impacting us all. And let's face it, while maybe not all of Tucker Carlson's audience might be able to see what Jimmy is talking about, there's a good portion that are waking up to the fact, as are many other Americans that are waking up to the fact, that we are stuck in a two-party system in which money is speech, corporations are people, our politicians don't care, care about us, they don't respect us, and I think it's long overdue that the American people see D.C. and the sycophants that are there for what they really are. They are inhuman. They have no solar compassion. They're doing insider trading. And they're not representing us, the people. I mean, owning a home is becoming impossible. Having a small business in America is becoming impossible. Our infrastructure is falling apart. We don't have Medicare for all. We don't, we're not doing anything about student debt. We have uh, a failure of all of our institutions. So I guess Jimmy Dore is vilified by the quote unquote managerial left. I'm taking that from Revolutionary Blackout Network. They've they've they coined that term and I think it absolutely perfectly describes outlets like TYT or secular talk or breaking points. And look, I'm all for sharing ideas. But first Let's let's talk about sharing ideas and sharing perspectives. Now, this is an article. Before we pull up the article, let's talk about this. Where Anna Kasparian, you know, the co-host of TYT, does something unthinkable. She goes on a right-winger show. They have a debate, as Kamala says. It's a debate. With none other than Ben Shapiro. You know, the guy really likes to talk real fast. Someone should ask uh, Ben Shapiro if he still has his uh, business dealing with Kamikoto knives. That's right. I'm going to still keep on digging at anyone that was trying to sell those fake, weak knives that were supposedly made of Japanese steel but came out of Hong Kong. Now, look, I'm not a geography expert, but Japan and Hong Kong, two different things altogether. So I want to pull up this video here. I find it interesting. The conversation increasingly becomes dominated by lunatics. And I don't think that's representative of most Americans. And there's also this problem of lumping in everyone together in like this neat little box of ideology, right? So I think in the mind, uh, minds of a lot of people on the left, you are the exact same person as Tucker Carlson, right? And I think you're different. I think you're different from Matt Walsh. I think you're different from Candace Owens. You guys are all on the same network. I commend you for having differences of opinion on the same network. And I'm sure it can be uncomfortable at times. But Huh, gee, sort of like when TYT used to have different opinions too. I remember that. I remember that era of TYT. I remember that era when uh, TYT would, uh, you know, like to lump people in, vilify them in certain groups here or there. I remember when TYT used to do, oh, a whole bunch of things all together. I remember when it used to be actually good to watch. But then, you know, that Katzenberg cash came flowing in. But there are nuances and differences, and I think it's important for people to be cognizant of that because I don't want to be lumped in with someone on the far left, right? I have, a, I have significantly different opinions from them. Yes, and by significant opinions, she means don't criticize the Democrats, don't criticize AOC, uh, don't try and shake things up, don't vote third party, don't vote independent, you know, that kind of stuff.
um, on certain matters. And I, I think it's important to know what those differences are and not let, again, the extreme ends of the spectrum represent the entire country. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned there is the idea that you have to run on something, not run against something. And obviously negative campaign. By the way, yeah, that lighting doesn't look too good on her. Campaigning is the most effective form of campaigning, despite all of the happy talk about how when you campaign for things, people rally behind you. People who are policy wonks tend to do very poorly in elections. People who are, who are attack dogs tend to do very well in elections because that lizard part of our brain that senses threat is really activated by a perception of threat on the other side. Oh, Well, actually, can I interrupt you on that? Sure. Because I agree and disagree. So let's go back to 2016. 2016. Oh, what an interesting pivotal year when the masks were finally taken off, when it was revealed that, yes, Bernie was a cuck, that there wasn't really going to be a real progressive revolution. And as soon as TYT got that Katzenberg cash, boy, oh, boy, were there changes. And that diversity of thought and different perspectives, it disappeared like overnight there at TYT. And, of course, there was also that, hey, fall in line with the Democratic establishment. Hey, we're going to be a little bit more corporate. Hey, we're going to be changing our perspective. And you didn't think anyone was going to notice TYT? But, okay, tell us what you think about 2016, Anna. Because with 2016, several years away, we can now really analyze it for what it was. Donald Trump's campaigning certainly had a significant negative component to it. Negative campaigning was part of what he did. But he also offered, or at least paid lip service to, something that Americans were concerned about, which was bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States. Stop the presses. Anna saying some nice things about Trump. Oh, my goodness. Anna... You know, it's a good thing you weren't on Fox News to share this. Um, really taking care of workers in our country, maybe reconsidering some of the foreign aid that the federal government shells out. That appealed to his base, so much so that even today they're so loyal to him, regardless of what he does. So he actually did give people something to vote for, whereas all we got from the Democratic Party during that election was, ooh, Donald Trump's dangerous. Isn't he so dangerous? Oh, my God, don't vote for him, because if you do... You'd be racist. Yeah, but then also there's all those great loser Donald segments that Jenk did back in uh, 2016. I remember those. So, you know, I mean, Anna, hey, you can't rewrite the past too much. I mean, you could say certain things happen here or there, but look, we all remember the infamous TYT meltdown. I mean, it's still up there on the internet, and it is magnifique. But, however... However, let's be clear here. The sad truth is about everything that happened in 2016 is that there was an opportunity in which people could have taken the initiative to do more and be better. But TYT went lock and step with the Democratic Party and also tried to come up with the laughable idea of trying to reform the Democratic Party through Justice Democrats, through brand new Congress, through our revolution. And it never came into fruition. It didn't come into fruition. It's interesting, though, because there's a lot that Anna and Ben Shapiro have found themselves to agree on, too, especially when it comes down to housing and for the homeless. Because, you know, Anna has a whole opinion about being homeless and what's happening to the people in L.A. Here, let's play this video. When I was living there, I mean, I've, I've pretty famously talked about this. I mean, it was the kind of place where I had a very nice house in a, fit, in a pretty decent neighborhood, and we had a gate in the front. Mm -hmm. And we would open the gate, and there would be a homeless person face down in the gutter, out, Edgar Allan Poe style, or there would be a guy outside the house shooting heroin into his foot. And I've got like a five-year-old. And th this sort of stuff has become incredibly common in L.A. You noticed it, and you, you've, you've been getting all sorts of flack for it. Right, because when they're... Because heaven forbid... Anna Kasparian is reminded that there's a homelessness crisis here and that the Democratic lawmakers in L.A. have done nothing. You know, TYT, not to tell you how to do your job, but L.A. is your backyard. You would think you'd be able to be more critical of these city lawmakers. After all, it's in California. This is your territory, your home turf. You guys are technically kind of sort of maybe the experts in that area, maybe the heavy hitters, but not really going to challenge the city council or call them out especially due to the fact that Katzenberg has influence over the city as well. I mean, who can forget that way back in 2020, 
Katzenberg had a one-on-one meeting with the mayor of L.A. and all the city council members. And surprisingly, there were some very harsh draconian rules and laws being made to dismantle the tent cities and displace the homeless again. There are problems in society. We need solutions. And you can't find solutions unless you acknowledge what the problem is. And the problem is housing has become unaffordable. We have a mental health crisis and we have politicians that have been saying they're going to do something, but systematically lie, favor corporations and large real estate developers in order to remove families that have been living in neighborhoods for generations. Yes, just like here in Chicago, L.A. has a major gentrification crisis happening there. And families who've been living in that city for, again, generations have been suffering, have been struggling. It's not right. So what do we do, Anna? Is And then properly diagnose it. So my biggest issue right now, at least with the way the left has handled the discussion on homelessness in places like Los Angeles, is there's this housing first mentality where, oh, everything would be fine as long as we put everyone in housing. And by the way, let me just note, housing is an important component to this. There is a housing crisis. There's a lack of inventory. I think we all know that. We do need to build more housing. But at the same time, treating the homeless population as if it's a monolith has been a complete failure. There is a huge mental health crisis happening in this country. So people with severe mental health issues are just left to die on the streets. And in some cases, you know, because they are experiencing an episode, they could carry out some sort of act of violence and assault someone. My question is, uh, who's shutting down the mental health facilities? It's the lawmakers. It's the politicians. We had that here in Chicago with our oh so fantastic mayor, former mayor, Rahm Emanuel. And his successor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, has done nothing to address the mental health crisis here in this city, the city of Chicago. So again, yes, mental health is a serious issue. Who's preventing anything being done about mental health or making sure there's more mental health clinic, clinics out there in L.A.? Who are the individuals? It's the city lawmakers. It's the local politicians. You know, again, it's it's easy to point fingers at the far left or the far right, you know, and say, well, they're offering to saying, oh, well, everyone needs a house and everything will be fine. That's not what everyone on the far left is saying. It's one of the things that's being asked, but also, hey. Mental health clinics, free health clinics, ensuring people are getting a job, increase in wages, Medicare for all. I mean, it's a multi facet system in which we have to try and fix a lot of issues. It just isn't a single thing. Yes, putting someone in a house or an apartment it could change the world for them. But there's other components, too. It, people on the far left aren't just asking for housing. Okay, you're singling out maybe one person that might be tweeting that out. But Twitter is not real life, Anna. And it's just it's a dangerous situation for everyone. Okay, the people who are just trying to go about their day and the person who is left on the streets battling with this untreated mental health issue. There are people who are obviously struggling with drug addiction. And you look at the number of overdose deaths and it has skyrocketed. The approach that we have implemented is clearly not working. More people are dying. And I, I get so much flack for saying this. I want an actual solution. It is insanely cruel to watch people die on our streets and then give yourself a pat on the back because you think you did something compassionate. That is not compassionate. Okay, well, Anna, you're also saying you don't want them in your sight, too. I mean, there's plenty of receipts on Twitter where good old Anna Banana Kasparian is uh, calling for those 10 cities to be removed. Housing and putting someone in a home does help, but there's other things that are needed, too. And these solutions have been offered. And boy, oh, boy, good thing those compassionate lawmakers in the Democratic Party at the federal level, at the state level, at the city level quickly adopted those policies because, yes, putting someone in a home is important, but there's other things, too. And it's a good thing those are they all oh, wait. They're not being implemented. The Democratic Party refuses to do anything about Medicare for all or mental health. The Democratic Party refuses to do anything about student debt forgiveness. The, uh, the Democratic Party isn't doing anything about this homelessness crisis that we are facing. But, hey, there was plenty of time to watch AOC and Cori Bush do a little dance at the Capitol Hill way back in 2021. Remember, 
Remember when Corey and uh, AOC had to run, run, run to stop Mama Bear Nancy, Nancy Pelosi from adjourning Congress? Remember that? And Congress got adjourned. And Congress went on its nice little vacation. Meanwhile, AOC and Cory Bush did a little fake protest. And it's a good thing they did something about the housing. Oh, wait, no. The housing crisis is still ongoing. So those are just two snippets from that overall interview. Shout out to, uh, uh, again, um, you know, uh, the crew at RBN for sitting through that. I mean, they went through the whole video, which is incredible. In its own right, I I think I'd probably have to throw a brick at the TV because I only can handle so much hypocrisy. But there's another article that also caught my attention, too. And it has to deal with, again, her being on Ben Shapiro's show. I get so much flack for saying this. Anna Kasparian talks failed leftist policies with Ben Shapiro. Failed leftist policies. Policies that at one point or another you saw them talk about on TYT. Hmm. Failed leftist policies. Interesting. I guess times and people do change. And you know what? I guess from here on out, I never want to hear TYT or anyone on the managerial left uh, say to us, well, no one should show up on Fox News. She showed up on Ben Shapiro's show. Get out of here with that BS. We ain't got time for that jazz. So liberal political commentator and host should put down neoliberal political commentator and host and a banana Kasparian said policies from the left that have not worked, especially policy related to homelessness and crime in Los Angeles need to be discussed. So an actual solution can be found. Well, she didn't have a problem with the city of LA just displacing so many communities. Kasparian an open and unapologetic member of the left caught flack from some extremists on the left, I think just normal people who are humans, uh, for engaging in a debate and discussion with people on the right. Well, that's what, T that's what TYT does all the time to Jimmy Dore. That's what TYT does all the time to Jimmy Dore. They say, oh, he had a boogaloo boy on his show. Oh, he was on Tucker Carlson's show. Oh, no, Jimmy Dore showed up on the Joe Rogan show. Oh, that's extremely right-wing. So right-wing. Again, continuing on. Um, now, most no most notably, again, talking about Ben Shapiro right there. Uh, back in 2021, Kasparian refused to back down or return to have a conversation with Shapiro, uh, Ben Shapiro for this week's episode of Ben... Sh <clears throat> Gotta do my Ben Shapiro impression. The Ben Shapiro show. The Ben Shapiro show Sunday special. Got to talk real fast. Buy Kamikoto knives. Uh, the approach that we have implemented is clearly not working. More people are dying, Kasparian said, of homelessness crisis in Los Angeles. Well, gee, huh, who are the lawmakers that are doing it? You know, L.A. is a Democratic city, like Chicago. We have heartless politicians here in this city, but I guess L.A. has it too. Hey, will, will TYT do an expose or an investigative report on it? Oh, that's right. TYT got rid of its investigative reporters. That $2 million just somehow disappeared, right? I'm not talking about the 20 million Katzenberg cash. I'm talking about the $2 million in which Jank was saying, we're going to have four horsemen of the apocalypse. Where's the four horsemen of the apocalypse to investigate what's happening in L.A.? I mean, that's, that's, that is your home turf, TYT. You could kind of sort of theoretically do something. She goes on to say, I get so much flack for saying this. I want an actual solution, and it has been offered before, Anna. Uh, it is insanely cruel to watch people die on our streets and then give yourself a pat on the back because you think you did something compassionate. That's not compassionate. We need to get that person help. Well, no, duh, right there with you. They need help. I don't care how vicious people think I am for saying that. It's just common sense. It really is. Kasparian said the issues in California and Los Angeles stem from a huge mental health crisis, drug addiction, lack of housing inventory. The less policy prescriptions have not been effective. The journalist said, arguing, but journalist. <laughs> Aaron Bussamate will have to say, he'll have to counter on that. Journalist, really? Okay. Said arguing and that ignoring and denying the problem is dangerous and particularly unhelpful for communities the left claims to care about. Well, they're 
Okay, first of all, all these communities have been abandoned by dem- corporate Democratic lawmakers. Do you see the Congressional Progressive Caucus doing anything to raise a ruckus or challenge their party? No, but they like to uh, bitch and moan when they're no longer having their committee seats and cry and feel helpless when they don't have power. Sabrina called that out perfectly about, again, the squad, because the only time they yell and scream is when, oh, they have no power at all and they want to cry about it. She goes on to say, denying that the problem exists is a is other part of this, Gasparian asserted. The journalist <laughs> ha, recalled, again, this is pretty sad right here, uh, recalled being assaulted in Los Angeles while she was walking her dog, having to deal with uh, backlash from some on the left for publicly speaking out about her victimization. And again, she talks about, you know, some jag off being pretty gross to her. So there you go. And so I have to think about it twice a day when I t- uh, take my dog out for a walk. Yes, it's traumatizing. What makes it worse, though, is that I'm the bad guy for sharing this story and saying, hey, we just can't have this kind of stuff happen. We need to find real solutions. During the same sit down, Shapiro and Kasparian battle it out on health care reform. The two agree that the health care system is currently broken. Hey, you agreed with a conservative, Anna. But Kasparian argued that the government funded Medicare for all type, while uh, Ben Shapiro argued for more privatization and community programs with the ending of the health care employer uh, connection. Once you make systems rational, you're going to have to, in some way, ration the resources, Ben Shapiro explained, noting that 12 to 24 hour delay ambulances with England's National Health Service. Uh, you're going to have to e- either increase the resources you're utilizing, which means increasing taxes or increasing regulations, or you're going to have to uh, or you're going to, have to ration uh, care that people are going to receive on the other end. Here, let's be very clear here. OK. Our healthcare in America royally sucks. Ben, we are not in the top 10. More Americans are facing medical bankruptcy or going into medical debt. Now, to my with, here's the thing. My international audience, people who live in Canada or in the European Union or in Australia or anywhere else where they have health care or a form of Medicare for all or national health care, they never heard of medical bankruptcy. Hey, Anna. The leading cause of homelessness isn't because somebody is mentally ill or addicted to drugs. It's another thing, too. It's, it's, it's called medical bankruptcy. It's the leading cause of homelessness. One bad day, you get sick with an ailment or have an untreatable uh, sickness or have a horrific accident or get afflicted with other, uh, something else altogether. Medical bankruptcy. Medical bankruptcy. <clears throat> Let me say that again for the people in the back. Medical bankruptcy is the cause, leading cause of homelessness in America. So obviously, good old Benji and Anna had a debate. But if you really want to shake the foundations of the world, you have to call out the entire system. Because if Anna's asking for solutions, here's one. Get rid of the jagoff politicians. We need to start building movements and organizations that are not connected to Washington, D.C. We need to start supporting citizen ballot initiatives that are going to fight for Medicare for all at the state level. We need to talk about doing UBI, creating programs and starting to separate ourselves from the corruption that's in D.C. We need to start supporting independents and third party candidates that are not part of the two party system. We have to start fighting for that better future because if we don't, nothing's going to change. But see, that means also stepping outside your safe space, stepping outside your bubble and talking to conservatives, libertarians, socialists, greens, and yes, Republican and Democratic voters. Because in America, corporate media, with the help of the two-party system, have done a phenomenal job in brainwashing millions of Americans and thinking that this is okay. It's okay for us to have medical bankruptcy. It's okay for us to have a housing crisis here in America. Because our politicians don't care. Both Democratic and Republican lawmakers. But I want to pull up this little conversation here. I know it's, it's going to be a little bit controversial. It's going to be a little bit shocking. It's actually somebody who's calling it as it is. Now, shout out to Case Study QB. He's wrongly being censored on Twitter. But here's where we have Jimmy Dore, surprise, surprise, on Tucker Carlson's show. Jimmy Dore show. 
Chris, what do you think it means? Jimmy Dore is the host of the Jimmy Dore Show. He joins us tonight to assess. Jimmy, what do you, should, should we be paying attention to a memo like this? What do you think it means? Uh, what I think it means is that the United States is trying to provoke and sable ratter with another nuclear power, right? This is what we were supposed to be afraid of what's going to happen with Donald Trump, right? We couldn't have, he's a crazy man who's going to have his finger on the nuclear button. And now we have Demented Joe who is sable rattling with two nuclear powers and they get the corporate media sponsored by the military industrial complex to get Americans to cheer it on. And why do Americans cheer it on? Because they have no idea what's actually happening with their foreign policy. And what's worse right. is and here, I want to just add it on here, too. Not only do Americans not know what's happening with the foreign policy, because there's a reason why we have a migration crisis. It's because of, again, the ridiculous war on drugs, the coups, regime change wars, and sanctions that are happening in Central and South America, which is leading the rise of dictators and cartels and other various factions that is causing instability. Not only do we not know what's happening overseas that our government is doing, but millions upon millions of our fellow Americans are unaware of the domestic policies that are being implemented on us by the Jagoffs in Washington, D.C. Both Democratic and Republican lawmakers in the United States Senate and House and previous Democratic and Republican presidential administrations. They have no idea that they have no idea with that. They don't have any idea what's happening with their foreign policy. We have 400 military bases surrounding China since the Korean War. Do we really think that China is getting ready to invade the United States? Because I tell you, they're not. They make everything we use in the United States. Why? Because the same people who want this war are the same people who took the good jobs that are manufacturing jobs in America, turned them into low paying, crappy jobs, and then shipped them to China. And then we get angry at them for the system that we set up if they're so corrupt, because that's the thing. Americans have no idea how corrupt their government is. They think our government's just regular corrupt, like, oh, Trump gave his son a job or Biden his and and that's the thing there's a lot of nepotism jimmy Dore is correct in pointing that out that yes we see these politicians and these dynastic families give their relatives and again uh friends and associates nice cushy jobs but it's another level of corruption altogether thanks to the supreme court the united states has legalized bribery no it's just not russia that can interfere into our elections anybody and anything with enough money can weigh in on an American election, thanks to Citizens United and the McCutcheon decision. So that means Democratic and Republican lawmakers can be bought. You hear that, TYT? Including Democratic lawmakers, too. So maybe instead of telling people to vote blue or we got to stop Trump, because never forget, Trump used to be a Democrat. You know, we have a corrupt system. So you're talking about solutions. Here's a solution. We need to start talking to our fellow neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, family members, co-workers, colleagues, and start waking them up to the fact that our government is corrupt, what they're doing at the domestic and foreign level, how they're doing insider trading, how they're allowing millions of Americans to face homelessness. They've effectively abandoned us. So the solution is we need to start looking at citizen ballot initiatives. We have to start looking at building movements and organizations that will not be influenced by the Jagoffs in the DNC or in the GOP. So all this Team Red and Team Blue stuff, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the failures. I'm tired of the false promises. I'm not going to waste my time, and I'm not going to waste any of your time by saying, oh, we got to vote for this person because they're better than the other guy. My team, Team Red, is better than Team Blue. No, Team Blue is better than Team Red. They're both the same. If you're a Democratic voter or a Republican voter, you're in an abusive relationship. Kid, a no, a no show job in the Ukraine war. That's not the whole thing is corrupt. The $800 billion military budget is $800 billion of corruption. Why do we have to have eight, 900 military bases around? We're the ones provoking this war, just like we provoked the war in Ukraine. We are now provoking a war with China. And what, who, who benefits? I'll tell you right now. Your enemy is not China. Your enemy is not Russia. Your enemy is the military industrial complex, which has been fleecing 
this country to the tunes of hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars. How many times are we going to have a defense secretary say, hey, we can't account for two trillion dollars in the Pentagon again, that, like, which has happened twice now in my lifetime. So, again, people are being uh, uh, the, the war machine cannot be stopped. Who's running this country? The war machine. It certainly isn't Joe Biden making these decisions. I would like to know who is making the decisions. And I just want to remind everybody, the United States is the world's terrorist. We just set the Middle East on fire in the last 20 years. And now we're doing a proxy war in Ukraine, which we provoked, NATO provoked, and was just admitted that we provoked it by the former prime minister of Germany. And now... Poor Tucker Carlson. He's making that face right now because his producer is yelling in his ear. All right, go to commercial. Go to commercial. He's telling the American people the truth. If all of Tucker Carlson's audience realizes that Republicans and Democrats are screwing us over, we'll have no control anymore. Oh, we're trying to stable rather with, with China, and they're predicting a war. Again, China's not going to invade us. China's not our enemy. They, we might have an economic war. That's what these are. These are economic wars. These are wars right. for in Ukraine. It's about liquefied natural gas and making sure Germany and Russia never come together because we fear Russia's uh, natural resources and manpower. And we fear them getting together with Germany with their technology and their capital. And so that's why we blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. That's why we're doing the Ukraine war. This is all about hegemony, imperialism and economic economics. And if there's a Marine somewhere, it's there because they're about to steal some natural resources from another country. As everybody's screaming about what a bad guy Putin is for invading Ukraine, the United States is currently occupying a third of Syria. And which third is that? It's the third that has the oil. And, and never forget Trump in a rare moment of true transparency. When asked why U.S. forces are there, he did not give the typical neoliberal answer that you would hear from Ronald Reagan, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton. Even Bush Jr. would have given this answer to Obama and even Biden. They would all say we're there for freedom, infrastructure, stability. But what did Trump do? Tr Trump told the truth. He told the American people why we're there. We're there for the oil, just like the reason why we were in uh, Iraq. We're there for the oil, Afghanistan, precious minerals, rare earths, anywhere that we're in, we're there for the resources. And Trump told the truth. <laughs> I know, like, it, it, it pisses off some of my uh, Democrat friends when I say that, like, Trump was transparent. Yeah, he told the American people the truth. He, he was the mask off moment. And what did outlets like TYT do? Oh, loser Donald. But not look at the bigger picture. See, Trump, see, he is the parasite, the rash that is wrong with American politics. He is indicating that something's wrong with the body. He's not the creator. He's parasitic. He knew how to survive in a system going through six bankruptcies and landing on his feet A-OK. -okay. Why? Because politicians like Biden Hillary and Bill Clinton, the Bushes, the Kennedys, McConnells, the Pelosi's. They built a system in which if you're rich, the laws of the land don't apply to you. How do you think TYT is doing so good with that Katzenberg cash? How do I know we're there to steal their oil? Because the president of the United States said so. Thank you, Jimmy. We're not, we're not even benefiting economically. That's I mean, of course, that's the rub. Nope. Jimmy Dore, appreciate it. Thank you. And see, that's how you bring the truth on a conservative network. You just don't say, I'm looking for solutions. I'm looking for solutions. I'm looking for solutions. The solution is break away from voting Democrat or Republican.